Welcome to the Migraine Miracle Moment. I'm your host, Dr. Josh Turknett. I'm a neurologist, migraine specialist, migraine sufferer, and author of the book, The Migraine Miracle. In this podcast, you'll learn all about how to find your path to migraine freedom without pills. Let's get started. Howdy, Beast Slayers. In today's episode, I will be answering a question from a recent clinic chat live discussion. This one is about cervical radiculopathy or a pinched nerve in the neck and menstrual migraines and whether that needs to be addressed prior to addressing menstrual migraine. Again, this question is an excerpt from a recent clinic chat live session for our Migraine Everland members that we do over Zoom. And if you're interested in taking part in these, as well as being able to submit questions of your own, you can learn more about becoming a member by going to mymigrainemiracle.com, and there will be a link to that in the podcast description. Along with being able to attend all of our clinic chat live sessions and watch all the replay videos of them, there's a whole host of resources there for helping you put the Migraine Miracle program into action to slay the beast once and for all. Uh, you'll hear mention in this episode of one of those uh, resources, which is our menstrual migraine protocol, uh, which members can access once they've completed the Beast Slayer Training Academy. Also, a reminder that we run periodic promotions just for our podcast listeners, and you can find out what the current promotion is by going to mymigrainemiracle.com forward slash moment. And lastly, I'm going to share a success quote from Yale, who says, I want to thank you for helping me back to my normal, healthy self. After years of suffering and useless neurological advice, I now focus on my diet and the results are amazing. It is not easy, and I did, and continue, to make mistakes, but the results are simply amazing. Well, thank you, Yale, for sharing that. Uh, The comment about useless neurological advice reminds me of an episode I did a while back uh, about why didn't my doctor tell me to do these things. So a lot of people, after going through the program, having great success, uh, and then thinking back on their years, often decades, of struggle, you know, often becoming uh, upset or even angry, uh, wondering why their doctor did never mention that there was so much more they could do besides drugs to stop migraines and, moreover, that the drugs might have an, even be part of the problem. And I mentioned there that the reason is that drugs are the tool that doctors have. Um, the primary job of a medical doctor in this day and age is to choose the best drug. That's what we're trained to do is figure out what the best medication or surgery is for a particular uh, person, even when there aren't great options. Um, there's the perception that a doctor is sort of looking at the entirety of every every possible thing that could be used to treat a condition, but typically that's not the case. Um, it's rather looking at the body of medications that could potentially be used and choosing the best one there. So drugs are the tools of the trade, and the problem in this case is they're not a great tool Um, and as we've talked about many times, tend to make things worse. All right, now, without further delay, here is the excerpt from the recent Clinic Chat Live discussion. Next question, I have cervical radiculopathy that flares up with menstrual migraines. Do I need to address that before my menstrual migraines are helped? This is a a topic we've covered some in prior chats. so the, uh, the ones related to questions about like cervicogenic headaches or chronic neck pain and so forth. So you, you might want to search for that as well. But um, the the gist in those discussions and relevant here is that it's important to remember that all pain ultimately is generated by our brain. Um, so just for, for background for anyone, cervical radiculopathy, um, essentially in its uh, correct usage, uh, or as correctly diagnosed, um, it's used sometimes as a blanket term, but is refers to a, a pinch nerve, uh, the one of, one of the nerve endings for the uh, in the coming out of the spinal cord in the neck, uh, so going down the arm. So 
a uh, case where one of those nerves is getting compressed either by arthritic changes in the spine or by a, a herniated disc that's pressing on the nerve. Um, but again, the gist is that it's important to remember that all pain comes from the brain um, and it's supposed to be uh, an indication of the condition of our body, right? It's just a signaling system um, intended, us, intended to alert us to something that deserves our attention. And in the in most cases of chronic pain, so chronic being you know pain that's persisting in a certain area past beyond a certain number of weeks, it's typically uh, generated by the pain system malfunctioning, and so it's no longer serving that adaptive pur purpose. So if you imagine what happens when you um, injure any body part, so most of us probably have are familiar with having some kind of in injury. So say an ankle sprain. It, you know, it hurts a lot at first, it swells, and that pain is there to let you know, hey, this, 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 this ankle isn't, you know, isn't uh, up to snuff, so take it easy while we, while we you know, let it heal. And as it heals, it stops her, you know, it hurts less and less, we're able to use it more and more, and that recovery process usually takes about six to eight weeks, and that's kind of true about uh, many different kinds of injuries. And when that pain persists for much longer than that, more often than not, it's not because the original problem is still there, it's rather because there have been changes in pain perception that have occurred, and these can occur for a variety of reasons, and it's a whole other subject about the mechanisms of why that happens, um, but it's rather than it still being something that's wrong with the ankle, it's now an issue with the, how the brain is perceiving pain from that uh, body part. And this is also true of things like uh, cervical radiculopathy. So I've seen a lot of those patients over the years. And one of the things that I can t tell them is that the good news is, you know, if, we, if you in two months, it's likely that this will be, you will no longer be symptomatic from this. You'll no longer be experiencing this pain. So most cases resolve in the typical time frame of healing. And the ones that persist usually point to another issue. That's not to say there can't be cases where there is still pathology that's problematic in that area. Uh, the role that the brain plays in this is so often overlooked. And this is a huge issue in healthcare because most doctors still don't quite understand this. And, uh, and so people end up chasing the source of pain in the body, uh, you know, going from one, part, one practitioner to the next when the pain has long become a brain phenomenon and not a body phenomenon phenomenon. Um, so this is also why you see so many neck and back and orthopedic surgeries where people say it didn't help or it made things worse because the, the pain was no longer a reflection of an issue that needed correcting in that part of the body. It was rather the brain's um, pain perception system having malfunctioned. And in fact, it's almost a certainty based on the research that things like chiropractic adjustments and acupuncture that have been shown to help with chronic pain aren't actually doing so by improving the particular part of the body, but rather are changing how that pain is being perceived in the brain. The good news there is that, you know, this is analogous to what's happening in migraine. Migraine is also a, a malfunctioning uh, pain perception system. And uh, so many of the things that uh, are going to be helpful in that, uh, in migraine are also helpful in these types of centrally generated pain. And I've had many, many patients um, over the years with this sort of these sorts of issues and um, the same things apply the best way to restore uh, restore pain uh, the pain system back to its sort of natural state is uh, very, very much in line with the same things we'd recommend for um, someone with migraines next question is i know we should limit starchy vegetables but if we eat them is it better to eat them raw freshly cooked or cooked and cooled I think this was a question us uh, about about our, uh, the topic of resistant starch. So the difference there being, so you have starch that is in starchy vegetables, and when it's cooked, we can digest it and absorb it, goes to the bloodstream, and eventually is broken down into glucose. On the other hand, resistant starch, which also uh, occurs in starchy vegetables, uh, so things like potatoes and rice that have not been cooked or have been cooked and cooled will have a good amount of uh, resistant starch. So too much and you'll get a stomach ache. That's why we, you know, raw potatoes 
or a bad idea. Um, but cooked and cooled, you'll get part some some starch and some resistant starch. And the difference between those two things is the resistant starch isn't absorbed, um, so it goes it bypasses the stomach, goes into the intestine, and then uh, there are bacteria there that are able to eat it as food. And there's evidence that the bacteria that it does feed are the kinds that we want to have around. So it's seen as a way of helping to promote a healthier microbiome. For someone who's you know mindful of carbohydrates, resistant starch won't impact, impact blood sugar uh, since it's not being absorbed into circulation. So that's kind of the idea behind those things. There are different um, things that have it in it. So like rice that's been cooked and then cooled, uh, potatoes that have been cooked and cooled. Uh, my favorite source for it, um, which I was doing for a while and I realized that I've, I'd stop, but I might do it again, it's green bananas. So eating a few of those. Um, and that way, the, the issue with the reheated you know, starches and so forth is you still don't, there's still going to be a proportion of regular you know, cooked starch. So you're getting a mix of things in that, re partly resistant, partly, um, partly cooked. So there's going to be some impact. Uh, the green bananas don't have any significant uh, impact on on blood sugar um so the so that's that was one reason i preferred them they're also uh, easier and again you know it's as with so much with the gut microbiome uh there's still a lot we don't know um but it's one of the things that makes sense theoretically and we'll probably learn more over time as to you know what impact that has and you know who it's best to do for but i think eating if you want to eat some um some uh green bananas from time to time. That's a perfectly reasonable thing to do. And I'll just throw in there too with the green bananas. If you slice them real thin and put them in a dehydrator, they make nice little chips. They, they do. <laughs> portion, you don't, you're not left with, you know, two thirds of banana you're not going to eat. Yes. Right. Yeah. I, yeah. I would never eat the whole thing. And so I, that's, that was the downside is we're always throwing away like two thirds of a banana. <laughs> and then we started dehydrating. And then we dehydrated. Right. All right, thanks so much for listening to this episode of The Miracle Moment. If you haven't already, be sure to subscribe to the podcast in your podcast player of choice. And if you know any fellow migraine sufferers, please feel free to share it with them as well. And now it's time to go out and slay the beast. Mm -hmm.